Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, why should Omaha have a tech conference with only women and non-men speakers? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we have talked about is uh, about the idea of equity and equity being different from equality. And so the idea of equity is that it's not about giving people equal amounts of things. It's about giving enough to make up for the lack in a different population. So you might have to give more to an underrepresented group in order to be truly fair and just rather than just what is equal. And so that's one of the kind of underlying values of the conference. Should we move to the next slide? Yeah, go for it. So <laughs> this is the number of years that men have had time to speak. And so like, if we were being truly equitable, we might think that women should get at least 10,000 years, the next 10,000 years. We can start any time. So. <laughs> Uh, we also, I, I'm sure both of you are probably familiar with this quote, kind of laying a, a, a few other arguments. Uh, the wonderful Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, I'm sure you've heard her say, she was asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? And her response is, uh, when there are nine. <laughs> there have been nine men on the Supreme Court, and we're like, well, why are there no women? I mean, they were to a point. Um, so why not have them? nine women on the Supreme Court. That's kind of the devil advocates approach yes. to when people say, why should women get all of this, this stuff? But let's talk a little bit about gender representation in general and what research says about it. Uh, so maybe some of you are familiar with the Bechdel test. This was uh, a test that actually, um, it's actually got a new name now. Uh, the woman who coined it, Bechdel, actually said that it was her friend's idea. So I am now forgetting her friend's name and I wish we had put that in the slide. But uh, the Bechdel test is basically, uh, there was a, a feminist uh, lesbian who was talking about the kinds of movies she wanted to see. And she said the minimum it had to have was it has to have at least two named women in it who talk to each other about something besides a man. And that is the bare minimum of what she needed to watch a movie. Yep, and uh, there are folks who have gone on to specifically track these. Uh, there's this Bechdeltest.com. Talks about 60% pass all three of those t tests. 60% of movies, not even, 57.8% of movies uh, pass all three of the tests. 10% pass two tests, 22% pass one test, and 10% pass no tests at all. There aren't even two named women in it. We can't even <laughs> get that. Um, and this is the media that we're seeing and that we're living in and that it's building our view of uh, the society that we live in. And we can't even meet such a bare minimum. I just want Netflix to show me not just <laughs> movies starring strong women, but movies passing the Bechdel test. I want that to be a category. Um, there's also been a lot of research on the visibility of women. Um, so the Gina Davis Institute um, is a, an institute that studies women's representation in media. And if there's 17% of women in a scene, men in the group think it's 50-50. And if there's 33%, men perceive there to be more women in the room than men. So this is also a problem of perception. Like we have had so many images of men in crowds that we are like wrong about how many really there are in the crowd. And so it's partly also like a different way of thinking. By the way, this isn't just something that happens to men. This happens to women too. Like we're all in this stew of like living in the same culture. So this is something that we're all seeing and feeling. So this might be kind of hard to see in here, but I think you can kind of um, get the general gist of this graph. Um, this is from 2015 speaking time for uh, men and women in uh, the top grossing movies of 2015. You'll see at the top there's the movies that had female leads, and at the bottom are the movies that had male leads. And uh, on average, across the board, men speak twice as frequently as women in these movies. Um, but even when there's a female lead, it kind of roughly, uh, over all of the movies, it's 50%. It's, it's men speak quite as, uh, just as often as women. But you see the real disparity when we get into movies with a male lead, which there are more of. Uh, men are given more speaking time, and we're just seeing the viewpoint, seeing the story from the perspective of men so much more frequently than we are of women. And again, that is informing how we are going out into the world and approaching the world. So what about real life? Yes. 
So uh, the chances of getting interrupted in a tech lecture are a lot lower for men than they are for women. We're not saying that men don't get interrupted and also basically it sucks to be interrupted. I'm so sorry if you were interrupted and I'm sorry if I've ever done that to you because I probably have and I didn't mean to, please call me on it. But women are interrupted a lot more often than men are and we don't even notice that this happens. This just is something that is kind of, kind of baked in. Um, it's also partly why women have certain behaviors. Uh, you might have heard a lot of criticism of women's speech patterns, like you'll talk about, well, women use like too much, or um, or filler words. Women have like upspeak at the end of sentences, and they talk too fast. Maybe that is because we are afraid of being interrupted if we pause. And so a lot of this leads into uh, specific psychological psychological concepts such as stereotype threat and imposter syndrome. I know I have been victim to both of them and yeah. I'm trying to find ways to uh, overcome that and focus on my abilities as opposed to how I'm viewing myself. But if you're not familiar, I feel like as I've spoken about stereotype threat a fair amount recently with folks, a lot of people are like, what is stereotype threat? I haven't even heard of that. So that's when members of a stigmatized group take on the cognitive load of managing the effects of stereotyping, using up that energy that they would otherwise have to put towards the work in front of them. So you're spending time internalizing, uh, am I being seen this particular way because of a given identity that maybe isn't representative of everyone in the group, when you could be focusing on finishing this task at hand. Um, and then imposter syndrome, I feel like there's been a fair amount more conversation around, uh, but they kind of collide a little bit, and you start to um, really question your identity along with your abilities, and that is when you can get into a whole <laughs> uh, world of mess. <laughs> but uh, both of these, uh, I think there have been some studies that have been showing it happens just as frequently as men um, with imposter syndrome, but stereotype threat is generally for any underrepresented groups or underrepresented folks in, in a group of people. Um, so really that's not even just speaking to women. If you're from an underrepresented minority in a group, you also are internalizing that identity and uh, spending potentially too much time focusing on that as opposed to the work that you should be doing. Yeah, and I don't think you put any of the pictures in, but you had had this wonderful set of slides that was shared in a Midwest Dev Chat. Uh, the, is this gender bias or, right. like do, is, is my idea bad or is it because I was a woman who said this idea? Is my code bad or is it because I'm a woman? Like imagine this running commentary in your head if you are somebody who is not from one of these groups. Like people who wonder, wonder about this all the time, they internalize it and then when they start to become aware of the issue, they're thinking about the stereotype threat like all the time. It's like running in your head at the same time. So it's a cognitive load as, Steph, as Jen was saying. Yeah. and um, it it's this chronic issue that grows on itself and grows on itself until it's too much to bear and it's even been found to have like substantial physical uh, issues in people who have been dealing with stereotype threat for a long period of time. So it's not just in your head, I mean it will manifest physically as well. Yeah, this, and then this was the surprising <laughs> stat. <laughs> right, in, in a lot of our conversations um, we pulled up this chat, there's um, I didn't put that number in there, I believe it's 80% 80, 80 of women in science, engineering, and technology say that they love their jobs. Um, and that's fantastic, we want people to love their jobs. However, uh, this study, and I can pull up the source if you guys want, uh, showed that 56% of women are leaving their organizations at mid-level points in their careers. So we talk and we talk about filling up the pipeline. You know, we want to get women and underrepresented minorities into tech but what are we doing about the space when folks actually get into tech? Are we creating a habitable space, a place where they can grow? And these numbers are making the argument that eh, we might not be succeeding in that area. Um, and we think that we can do better. Yeah. Um, there's also diversity debt that companies accrue over time. So we know that once you get a certain lack of diversity, it becomes very higher, hard to hire for that diversity afterwards. And studies have shown that it starts to accrue after a fourth hire, uh, speeds up after 10, and becomes next to impossible to change the numbers on after you get 20. And it's because you don't have enough people leaving to make up for the fact you would have to hire, think about how many women you would have to hire to get the ratio to 50-50 if you already have 50 people working for you. 
you would have to hire the next 50 people be all women, and that's going to be impossible for almost every organization. Also, if you have no women and you have 50 employees, what woman is going to want to work there? Do they want to be the first woman working in a co company that already has 50 male employees? And it also happens with uh, minorities. Um, I've just heard this anecdotally, like, uh, women and underrepresented minorities that are my friends talk about looking at websites, looking at LinkedIn, trying to find another woman who works for the company, trying to find another minority who works for the company. They don't want to be the only one. So uh, diversity debt accrues over time and can be much more difficult the larger it grows. Did you have yeah. more to add? Um, just thinking about in general the, the most recent folks you have maybe hired within your company or have seen hired within your company, how many of them came in through the network of employees that you currently have? And then think about how diverse is your personal network. So the people that you're then looking to bring in uh, to your company if you want to make it a, diverse, a more diverse company. And um, I, I find that starting to have that self-reflection really shines the light back on ourselves and the things that we can do even if we're not in a position of hiring. Yeah, the network part is so important too. If we're all hiring our friends, and most of our friends are people of the same gender or race as us, we're going to hire more like white guys. But good news! Yay! Now Sorry. that we've depressed you. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, so there's not really a slide for good news, except for the fact that there is good news. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to talk about it. So there um, are, right here in our community, some really wonderful things that are happening. Um, with the conference that we're putting on, we have uh, been working with Women in Tech in the Heartland with, um, as kind of an advisory group, and they have passed 1,000 members. It's wild. 1,000 people have signed on and said, I want to be a part of WIF. Uh, so I think that we can energize that group in a very positive way. Uh, we also have the wonderful founders of Mystery Code Society, two of whom are in this room. Mm -hmm. And if you're not familiar with that group, they are a nonprofit who are creating curriculum to get women, femmes, and non-men uh, interested into tech. I mean, literally right now, they're finishing up a course where these students are learning how to build video games. Like they taught them Unity this summer. They're amazing. Uh, we also have the UVO World Summit, which is happening right now, that's not specifically focused on tech, but that is empowering young women, and there's definitely a tech angle to it. They're, they're bringing in tech companies to show role models in tech and, and things like that. And also, there's a fourth. Oh, ACMW chapters are growing, and I don't know if you, if you folks have heard of that, but that's the Academy for... Computer Machinists, I want to say? Yes. The, yes. Uh, and I know that the, the chapter at UNO is growing, and I believe there's already a, a pretty active chapter in Lincoln. So there are some positive things that are happening locally. Also, we neglected to put on our notes, but we should mention Project 18 is a yes. cool new yes. thing. If you don't know what Project 18 is for, um, Project, uh, there was a study that came out that ranked cities by how uh, friendly they were to women in tech, and Omaha was ranked 18th, so Project 18 is something that Rebecca Stavik kind of put together. It's a movement. It's not really a group, I would say, although there is, there is a working group, um, but they are trying to make Omaha the number one place for women in tech. Mm -hmm. Yep. So there is good news. There is progress. There are wonderful things happening. And uh, we have some recommendations. Uh, that we'd like to dig through. I kind of have a slide for each, just kind of ping pong a little bit. Uh, women should form alliances. There's research that shows that if a woman stands up for herself in a meeting, she's uh, negatively, she's, it's received negatively. However, if another woman stands up for a woman in a meeting, that is received positively. So we need to stand up for one another and form those alliances and speak up for one another when we have the opportunity. Jen, that is a very good point. Also, <laughs> Men can do this too. This is it's, so yeah. helpful. Um, th I think also every woman I know has been in a meeting where they said something and then it was like ignored and then like five minutes later somebody else says the thing and they're like, that's a good idea, George. And they're like, I was like, that was my <laughs> idea. Go ahead. Uh, please speak up if you should say something. Um, there are, I think people are a little bit afraid to do this. So, I mean, use your common sense. Some women, if they're in an uncomfortable situation, would rather have that be something that they're not saved from, that is kind of ignored. So, but I think all of the things that apply to just being a general human being apply here. So if you can help somebody, help somebody. Like, this works in our workplace. It also works in the community. 
yeah, anecdotally you might have heard uh, or experienced even, um, you are taking in some form of bias and you think that that is just how things are. That's how you're used to everything operating. That's how you're used to being received. If someone who, if, if you see that as an outsider and you're like, that's not how you treat everyone else. Speak up, say something, uh, go to HR, go to that manager, because sometimes the individual who is on the receiving end of that bias just thinks that's the way things are and they don't know um, to say something or they don't feel safe. Yeah, and letting somebody know that you are a sympathetic ear or that you've seen something sometimes helps people to either who aren't aware of it or they know they have an ally. Revamp your hiring processes. Now, we can talk about this for the rest of the day. <laughs> um, however, uh, I mean, look at you know, the, the listings that you're having. I mean, are you using gender, term gender terminology? Are you, look at the uh, percentage of the people who are applying for the job. I mean, where are you losing out on those numbers? Because uh, it, it does end up being a numbers game. If you're bringing in more people, a more diverse set of applicants, you are going to lead to hiring a more diverse set of employees. Um, I know there were other tips. This, uh, Although there was, a, there was a caveat there with the hiring, though. So there was a study that showed that if you have an underrepresented group in your hiring pool, but there is just one out of a much larger pool, their chances of being hired are close to zero. You need two in the pool in order to properly evaluate and for the bias to, to go away. So bear that in mind. Yes. And, and a lot of this, I, we should have maybe linked to her Twitter. There was a, a wonderful thread that a former developer in Omaha, well, still a developer, but formerly of Omaha, um, put out there that was kind of talking about different things that companies can think about in terms of revamping their hiring processes. Um, and I will tweet that out later because I think that she deserves the credit for those thoughts. Yep. Um, and then also some of it is about the company itself. So implementing women-friendly policies, which are usually just friendly policies for everyone, but some of those examples are paid parental leave that doesn't depend upon the gender of the parent, um, like which should include adoption, which should include like family supportive policies, um, allowing remote work if it's available, or at least allowing for a more flexible schedule so people can make family life work. Some policies you know of? Yeah, I mean, there's also the obvious ones. I mean, have, I guess I say they're obvious, maybe they're not to everyone, uh, but have a nursing room, offer time for your employees if they're nursing to go take that time and be able to feed their child while they're- That's required by law, by the way. Over <laughs> 25 employees, I yeah. believe. So even small companies don't have to, although a lot of them do. Yeah. Um, when you're saying something, maybe think to yourself, uh, would I say or do the same thing if I was speaking to a man? Uh, would I say it in the same way? Would I interrupt and uh, make the same comment if it was a man that I was interrupting? Uh, just kind of run those things through your head, no matter the gender. Is that something that I would say? Is that an action that I would take if, it was, if I was doing it or saying it to someone of a different gender? If not, maybe don't consider saying it. I think this one is actually the hardest one because this one requires your brain to have another thought in it while you're talking and to have an awareness of what you're doing in the moment you're doing it. And I know that that is hard. Um, but I also think that this is important. Like this is part of the, the, the bias that's kind of baked in that we're not even aware of. And this also applies to underrepresented groups, not just to women. So um, in your interactions, I think, I think the privileges of not being aware of something mean that maybe we should do the work of making awareness our job. Um, so that's just my plug there. I know this is, this is maybe the hardest one. <laughs> Reach out. Uh, I know that I found this to be a huge one. I'll use an example, actually. Uh, uh, former company that I worked at, Agape Red, we had free coffee. Do they still have free coffee? That's the thing? Yep. I don't know. I've, I think that there are several people there because it is a caring group of people who would take it upon themselves to say, hey, everyone who's in the office, we're going to get coffee. Like, do you want to come with? I think that having that sort of an invitation extended to everyone is going to make people who don't necessarily feel a part of that in-group, who don't feel like they would maybe necessarily belong, they're not as close of friends, for whatever reason, um, it helps bring them together and make them feel more involved. And so little things like that, if you're going to get lunch, if you are ordering lunch in, reach out and offer that to everyone. And then here is maybe the truth about 
diversity in the workplace that is going to be a little uncomfortable, like it won't feel good. Like there's a lot of evidence that there's that evidence that if you have a more diverse workforce, that it's actually more uh, like a, a better functioning company, that it actually makes more money, that it actually is more efficient. But if you ask the employees how comfortable they feel versus like a culture where it's like all guys and they're like all friends and they all go do the same thing together and they love like a very particular type of video game, like those employees at that monoculture company are way happier and like more empowered. But like diversity feels a little less comfortable. Like there's people there that are not like you. And so I think being aware that we're gonna feel less comfortable, but also that we can reach out and still make connections with each other without us being all this exactly the same is an important thing to bear in mind. Here's another hard one. <laughs> Uh, I can't tell you how much it would help the women in your lives if you shared your salary with them. I know that that's a hard conversation for a lot of people to have. I think this is also good for women to tell other women about their salaries. I think this only helps people. Really the people who benefit from you not sharing your salary are your employers, some of whom are in the audience, so thank you for employing us. But. Uh, Really, it's to their benefit and not to yours to share your salary. This is something that everyone can do to help somebody. And I know that this is awkward, but I'm gonna make a plug for it anyway. Yes. Expand your networks. I touched on this a bit earlier. I mean, when your company is looking to hire folks, you a lot of times are thinking in your networks. Who's somebody that you know I would like to work with? Who's somebody I already know who's looking? Uh, and expand your networks and you're going to have a larger pool of folks that you can invite from. Uh, also, Twitter can be great for this. Even beyond finding people to recommend for a job, uh, just allowing you to hear from different voices that are maybe different from the folks that you are actually interacting with in person from day to day. Yeah, and um, so there was actually something in the community about this that reminds me of this. So in 2014, Nebraska Code had for, uh, started for the first time 48 speakers, all men, and Rebecca Stavik tweeted about this. I wasn't actually aware of it. I wasn't in, uh, in the tech community at that time. And what that, the organizers said that they didn't have women apply as speakers, so that's why they didn't have them. And what I see that as is not a failure necessarily of the organizers, it's a failure of the organizer's networks. Like that is where the network is key. You need to actually have people in your network who are women and underrepresented groups in order to reach them and let them know that you're starting a new conference and you would love to have them speak there, so. Yeah. And listen, if someone that says there's an, a problem in your uh, environment or in your community, let's listen and hear them out. And uh, yeah, pretty straightforward. Yeah, if we're reclaiming our time, uh, we are actually asking you to listen to us. That's the point. Yes, so we have a little <laughs> bit of time left, uh, I don't know, five minutes or so. Um, and so we were gonna just kind of open the floor uh, because you all are a part of the community. And uh, we are wondering what you think about this idea, what you think about this opportunity. Uh, yeah. Yes. You talked a lot about why mm -hmm. and the need. You talk about specifically what goals are for this conference or like what's been, what you're trying to actually do with it? Sure. Yes. We were not trying to like sell the conference. Sure. Um, so we veered clear of that a bit, but since you've asked, <laughs> it wasn't a plan, I promise. <laughs> um, so, so our goals include amplifying the voices of women and non-men and really lifting them up as thought leaders in the community, uh, connecting people across our community. I mean, we have this 1,000 plus uh, women in tech in the Heartland community. However, if you talk to most women in the community, they probably don't feel super connected. I know anecdotally, that's what uh, we have been told and we, we did a validation survey to get some information around that as well. Uh, we also wanna celebrate the accomplishments of women and non-men as well. We wanna you know, shout out from the rooftops the kinds of things that folks are doing out there. And then educate is yes. the last one we would like to do. We'd actually like this to be a conference where just like everywhere else you learn something cool that you yes. can do. Budget cycles start early, so do you know which month of the year? We're aiming for March or early April. Thank you. Yes, that planning is all underway at the moment, and hopefully we'll be short up soon. <laughs> we'll start with Seth and then. No. Uh, are you worried about um, local controls who might um, try and insert themselves into the conversation? If so, um, have you also considered setting up a legal defense fund that some of us can 
I have definitely, it's, it's crossed my mind and I've been concerned about it and have left it at the, let's cross that bridge when we get to it. But that is a wonderful tip. I don't know how much thought you've given to it, Wendy. Uh, well, we had to think of it for Mystery Code Society. We had the same concern that as a women's only coding organization. Right now, we mostly have protections around our code of conduct and very strong rules for how grievances and code of conduct violations would happen. So I imagine that those rules would be just as robust. We haven't thought as far as legal defense fund, but that's an interesting idea and we should talk more. Money yeah. White males who can, yeah. Can put a lawyer on who can write strong letters. That would be fantastic. If we if women don't have to bear the full brunt of the defense of themselves, that's a big help to us. That's a really great point. Thank you. I agree. Yes. Yeah, I can tweet them. I'll put them on SlideShare and tweet them out or something. Oh, and sorry. So that I'll MP Jenna. I'll tweet it up from that. No, no, my feedback would be, I would say the same thing in probably the same manner to a woman, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I mean, now if it's abusive, maybe don't say it to anyone. I'm not suggesting you've ever said anything abusive. To be clear, I should clarify that. Yeah, no, but um, I, I think that, um, yeah, I don't think that you should hold back. I don't think that women are, are these special flowers that need to be treated differently. I think that we um, want to be treated the same and that's part of it. And I think that potentially there's a loss of growth opportunity if not approached. There's the a, way. there's some, <laughs> but there are some studies to show that women actually don't, part of the reason they don't get promoted is that the men who are bosses over them don't give them enough feedback for them to make the steps needed to get to the next level. And so if you deprive them of good critical feedback that's like pointed, uh, then uh, you will be depriving them of an opportunity to grow. There is also some um, evidence to show that the criticism of women tends to be about their soft skills and the criticism of men tends to be about their hard skills. So that might be something to look at if you're criticizing a soft skill. But um, yeah, I would say send criticism. Can I just connect with them? Uh, just because I'm in the same boat with what happened where I was in a uh, supervised position, supervisor position for the past six years in which I would have uh, employees who are women. And it was one of those situations where, uh, just to answer your question, I feel in that situation, individuality is really important as you really have to individualize that feedback to that specific person, which will go way further. Uh, but the challenges I had in that position is how to um, reach out to an employee who's a woman when it came to personal um, problems in which like I didn't want to be insensitive because like you know I'm not a woman and I don't know exactly what you're going through and I want to respect you and give you 
like every time you need, but I also don't want to be abused, if that makes sense, or get in trouble if I'm not like careful with what I say, does that make sense? Just because of the culture we live in, you know, I don't want to get accused of being insensitive or being misogynistic, which that's not the case at all. I'm just trying to be fair. I think there's definitely different personalities of people of all genders. Yeah. And there are definitely men who are going to take something a little more sensitively than others. And there are women who are going to take things more sensitively than others. And I would suggest that that's part of being a manager and learning to walk those lines. Um, I don't know if you have. Um, I would say it's great that you're thinking about that and maybe talk to some women in your life who are managers for feedback before you give that kind of criticism. Like expanding your network like that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. So you were talking earlier about how a big problem is like networks and how the problem lies in the fact that a lot of people may just, you know, they, their networks consist of a lot of people who are like them. Well, what are some of the benefits that maybe aren't so obvious that you've thought of that will come as a result of, you know, more interconnecting those networks rather than having them so clustered and separate? Yeah, I think um, they're the same benefits that um, happen to companies that are diverse. You make better decisions because you are aware of more blind spots that you have. Um, you also have, um, like, I, I would say, like a, a bigger view of the world, so you can make those better decisions. Um, and I would say, I would say the other thing is just that's sort of a value of mine, but like we should be really appreciative of this world. Like it's a great big world. There is so much in it. Like there is not enough time to look at it all, but we shouldn't all be looking at the same thing all the time. So this is just my plug for diversity. Do you have more? Uh, yeah, I, I feel like this is, is just super cheesy to say, but I, I feel as though just putting a pointed effort into hearing from more diverse voices, you're going to hear about new problems from new directions that you haven't considered before, um, and not even necessarily relating to your job. Uh, and it's just going to give you a new way to, to think about the world and to think about how you're interacting within it and how your actions, however benign they may be, how they may be perceived by someone else. And so then I would say the end result with that would tend to be uh, a, a world that people like interacting with a little bit more because we all have, have those thoughts running through our heads and uh, are considering those kinds of things as we go forward. Uh, your question, but. Awesome. Well, we're oh. over our time. Um, so yeah, thanks for coming. And we'll tweet the, the slide deck out. And there will be more information to come about the conference, I'm sure. There will be a name, too. Where should we find information about this conference as it comes out? Follow, follow our two <laughs> Twitter handles. There you go. Yes. yes. Awesome. Thanks, ladies. Thank you.